Hey, good morning, Last in Line Nation. Uh, welcome to another episode of Last in Line Leadership. And the theme in November, as you know, is kingdom business. And we're setting the tone in our workplace, in our communities. We're trying to learn more and grow on how we can balance our faith around those environments, in those environments where it may be, we may be the only one there that represents that faith. So we're trying to learn how to do that. We're trying to be better at it. And we want to be a reflection of our faith to that, to the, the, the people that may not know what the truth is or may not understand faith. So today I got a really good guest. Um, I just met this guy, <clears throat> excuse me, virtually, of course, how we're meeting a lot of people nowadays, but through a, a mutual friend. And I just had to get him on because he's doing powerful things. Uh, he's, he's starting out his ministry. He's starting out his platform. He's written a book. He's, he's just got a lot of great messaging that's out there. Um, so I had to bring him on because I know he's got good perspective. Uh, his name is Robert Harper the second. And I'm going to do a little background for Robert, but he's going to go into more of that because he's going to be way better at talking about himself than I am. So. <laughs> So I'm going to tell you what, you know, looking at Robert's bio, man, this is a, this is a beautiful uh, presentation that he sent me, but he uh, graduated from the University of Houston, go Cougs, and uh, he is one of five children. He is a, um, he's a speaker, he's an educator, he's a minister, of course, he's an author, um, wrote a book called Talk to Yourself. I want to hear more about that, but, you know, Robert lives here in the great city of Houston, and man, Robert, I'm just honored to have you. Welcome to the show, man. And good to be here with you, Johnny. Yeah, this, this is a privilege, man. And it's always awesome to meet people, meet new people, uh, people yeah. that we may have never even come across, man. We got people that connect us, and, and here we go. Our, our journeys are aligned right now for this moment, and uh, man, talk about your book. Talk about your background a little bit. Okay. Yeah, I go into a little bit. Um, so, um, you know, my background, my background's in ministry, uh, backgrounds in motivational speaking, and I get a chance to do a lot of work with different people. And, you know, one of the things I've learned, you know, as I was a kid, you know, growing up, uh, I had a tragedy that happened to me, uh, my family in general, that put me uh, in, um, in, in a greater understanding of what it means to suffer, right? Um, my my grandmother, my aunt, my three little cousins were murdered, uh, and and for me, if it, you know, if anybody knows me, that we know that you know they were like the backbone of of the family. Mm -hmm. uh, those our family, you know, my, my grandmother was, and just a great person, great individual. Uh, she did work in the community, and so at a very young age, I, I felt like you know that wasn't fair. You know that that's not supposed to happen. That's not supposed to. You live a good, godly life. You try to do the right thing. And, and then uh, something like that happens to you. And so as I got older and I began to interpret that, what does that really mean? I, I realized that, you know, life is not fair. You know, mm -hmm. life is not fair, nor is it unfair. You know, life is life. And that it, it really it really matters on how you, your perspective and how you t choose to deal with whatever the circumstances that comes about in your life. You know, so, um, you know, so for, so for me, I really try to help people with that. I try to help people with, the idea of what it what it looks like going through something and adversity and suffering, because I found out that people usually don't give up uh, simply because of what happens to them. They give up because of what they interpret, the interpretation of what happens to them. Mm -hmm. You know, they see the loss instead of the gain uh, all mm -hmm. the time. And so um, I try I try to really help people with that. And I think I think a lot of times we get stuck, we get parked, we get paralyzed simply because of what what is happening to us and the the impact. That life can make on us sometimes, right? And so, uh, you know, my job, my, my 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 joy is to just really help people shift and to pivot and to get a new perspective on life, so they can get going again. Because it's not just about them; it's about the impact that they that they can make, potentially make on others, right? And so, um, and that's one of the reasons why I wrote the book as well. Talk to yourself. You know, talk to yourself can it can be a can be something that uh, we need to do on a regular basis. You know, we probably already do it, you know, without even thinking about it. But I, I think about the uh, the story of King David and how King David on one occasion, 
he, his, his army, his men were upset with him. They were mad at him. They were ready to come against him. And because they trusted him, but uh, they, the women and the children were, were taken away by the enemy. And mm-hmm. so now it's, it's all, it falls all on David's shoulders. He, he, he holds the responsibility. And so now they're upset, they're mad, they're angry. And, and David uh, simply encouraged himself. That's what the Bible says, that there was no one there to encourage him, so he encouraged himself in the Lord. And what I took away from that is that it's not always uh, the worst thing to go through a bad situation, mm-hmm. but the worst thing is to go through a bad situation alone. Right. Yeah. When there's no one there to say, you know, John, you know, things are going to get better. You know, look up, you know, tough, de- you know, tough times don't last always. Right. Mm-hmm. When you have someone there to encourage you. It makes it a little bit easier. Right. But what, what about when you don't have anyone? What, what if you don't have anyone that understands or or gets it? Right. And so what we have to do is encourage ourselves, encourage ourselves in the Lord and just remind ourselves of who we are and whose we are uh in that particular moment that particular time and i realized i saw a lot of people becoming the villain in their own story sabotaging their own success and i just didn't want that you know for people you know i would i would listen to stories and i would hear people say hey i want to do this i want to do that i have these goals i have these dreams i have these ambitions and they would even tell me what what would be required for them to do that and i would get excited about it but eventually they would say but you know and, and for me, that was heartbreaking because I felt like whatever the dream was, whatever the goal was, like it won't be manifested. People won't have it. They won't be able to experience it, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, because of a lack of belief, a lack of belief on your end. And so uh, I said to myself, how can we get people to truly, truly believe in themselves, like on a subconscious level where it's rooted in their, in their minds and so they can really begin to act upon it? Because I'm a firm believer that actions expose belief. Mm-hmm. Actions always expose belief, man. Uh, I would tell my students uh, a while ago, I would say, hey, you know, uh, why, why, are you not, why are you not coming in with a backpack? Why don't you have a pen? Why don't you have a pencil, you know, to come to class with? And uh, I would ask them, I said, hey, do you want to be successful? And they would say yes. You know, I said, well, do you believe you're going to be successful. And they would say, yes. I said, no, you don't believe you're going to be successful because if you believe, actions always expose belief. You would show up with a pen. You would show up with a pencil. You would have paper because that's what, that's what, that's what actions does, right? That's what, level, when you have the level of belief, your mm-hmm. actions follow, right? So yeah. uh, I just want to encourage people to say, okay, you have some yeah. goals, you have some gifts, you have some dreams, and people need to know, people need to know, uh, need to experience that. They need to know what that's about, you know, and they need to get, be able to uh, be touched by, by what you bring to the world. And so right. uh, that's one of the reasons why I wrote the book. John. That's awesome, man. I was looking at your bio here and one of the sentences, <clears throat> last sentence of this paragraph says, he knows how to meet you where you are talking about your message and your style and your speaking it says he, he knows how to meet you where you are, but love you enough not to leave you there. And that's kind of what I'm hearing you say is you hear people's story and you don't want to leave them there where they are, you know, and, and you, you want to be that person that kind of ignites the fire that gets them out of that, that mud, that pit, that, that, um, you know, the hole that they're in basically. And so I think that's awesome. And I think everybody has the ability to do that for people. And if everybody does it in their own little pocket of the world, I think things are going to start to change. We're going to start to see a huge ripple effect and how this, this place can change for the better, and we can impact other people's lives. And so that's why we're doing this, you know, and I had a long time ago in my heart to, to talk about kingdom business. And what I, why I call it kingdom business is just operating your faith in the workplace or faith in the environment you're in, community, whatever social circles you're in, you know, you can be the only Christian sometimes. So how do we balance that? How do we operate? And, you know, the, 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 theme of this kingdom business underneath that is setting the tone and the t-o-n-e stands for different categories here in this topic and i want you to i want to get your perspective on some of this so the first one's tempo uh you know we got to set a tempo right like every team has a culture every culture requires a tone to be set to establish a foundation that kind of identifies that culture right so my question to you is in the teams that you've led or in the people that you're leading now um, even though you're in a ministry environment, you know, 
I know you've been exposed to different types of settings where you had to sort of be the tone setter. So talk to me about how we establish that culture in any team environment. Yeah, I think it's important to establish a good culture, you know, John, for several reasons. But the one, one of the reasons why I think it's so important to establish a culture is because the culture is something that the team can rely on when, when difficult days come, right? And so if you, if you create a culture that is uh, a culture that's based upon honesty, integrity, uh, a culture that's based upon even mercy and grace, compassion, you understand that, that, that these are servanthood, right? These are, these are principles that can, that can benefit us all. So, for example, if a person does not, is, does not have a good day, right? Say today, mm -hmm. I, I'm just not feeling today. I'm not having a great day. I hit the cat, got an argument with my, my spouse. Something's going on with that person, and today's just not their day. And so what happens is when they go into the, the, the team setting, when they go into that culture, they can rely on the culture. They can rely on the culture to uplift them, to encourage them, to benefit them, to motivate them to get to where they need to go for that mm -hmm. particular day. They're not, they're not thinking that the culture mm -hmm. is judgmental, that, that somebody's uh, micromanaging them. They believe the culture trusts them. They believe the culture. You see, this right here, the culture can set a, set a strong foundation. The culture and having that strong foundation can really set uh, the tone for, for people getting through tough times and difficult days, right? Mm -hmm. And I, th I think for me, it's, it's, it's like uh, the parable that Jesus gives when he talks about the two houses being built. And yeah. it talks about the idea that one's on sand, the other one's on, on a solid foundation, mm -hmm. and that the storms are going to come. The storm is going to come in life. The suffering, the pain, the adversity is going to come in our lives. But the problem, but, but the question is, is, are, is the house going to be able to stand mm -hmm. when the storms come? Is the house going to be able to withstand the, the adversity and the trouble and the, the hardship when it comes, the op opposition when it comes, right? And so when you have that strong foundation, you have that strong culture, when it's really rooted in something that's strong, then the, 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 even with, when the op opposition comes and the adversity comes, a person can still uh, stand, right? Yeah. The team can still make it, can still endure because the foundation is strong. And so that's yeah. how I look at like, you talk about a business setting, the culture. The culture is that foundation. It's mm -hmm. the foundation. If the foundation is strong, then even when the opposition comes through people every day, they can still stand and they can withstand uh, any, any tests, any adversity, any difficulty because the foundation or the culture has been set. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I love that because, you know, it is, um, it's not, it's easier kind of said than done sometimes. And it doesn't necessarily happen overnight. Like right. in, any leadership roles I've had, you've got to gain the trust of the people and you've got to gain the team's sort of buy in on that. And, Talk to, you know, kind of elaborate on what you just said in, in the, the degree of what, what kind of, what do you have to set as marching orders? Like as you as the leader, there's got to be a cadence that you set from a foundational standpoint, like you talked about, the foundation, like the integrity, the character. But tell me, do you, do you have, a, have an example maybe of a team that you led or a team you're leading or even something you've seen kind of external you've watched a team either survive and thrive really well based on what you talked about or a team that struggles and why, you know, what is their leader lacking to create those ethical marching orders and that cadence, if you will, to kind of set that rhythm and set that tempo. Yeah. It, it's for me, I give you an example and John, you know, I, I used to do uh, a lot of youth ministry and right now I get a chance to kind of, um, uh, spread spread the spread the work around with different mm -hmm. with the other individuals that that are yeah. coming and, and doing ministry as well but uh early on i had a group that was really really on fire for god you know young people that just loved anything that i suggested they were they were on fire they were ready to go mm -hmm. and um and it made things a lot easier for me as, as a leader right uh just because of their spirit and their attitude going into it but then that group graduated right and then there was another group coming in coming up up behind them and they didn't have this zealous spirit right they, they weren't on fire and yeah. one of the things I, I had to i had to you know either i could sit there and say man you know they're not like the other group you know compare them and so i said no i need to gain the trust of these young people right and so what i, what I realized was that it's about caring like people want to know that you genuinely 
genuinely care. It's not just about the teaching. It's not just about the Bible studies. It's not just about the ministry. Uh, but ministry is about care. You know, like, like, are you involved in their lives? Are you impacting them? Are you reaching them where they are? And that's why I really, you know, that, that phrase, the idea of uh, meeting people where they are, but loving them enough not to keep them there, right? Mm -hmm. Because I think when you meet people where they are, you genuinely show that you care. Um, uh, it, it does something for people. It makes people open up at, to things that they probably perhaps weren't really um, really to, willing to open up to. And I think that's the pattern that Jesus sets, right? You know, Jesus always meets people uh, where they are. They meet, he meets a physical need first, and then he goes in for the spiritual need. Yeah. And, and, and that's the example that I've seen in the scriptures, you know, whether he was on the boat with Peter, he would, you know, supply the fish first, you know, but then he would tell Peter like, hey, you know what, it's not about fish. It's about being fishers of men, right? Yeah. Like yeah. this is a spiritual, spiritual thing. But he supplied the, the first physical need. And the need was he was a fisherman and he needed he needed to he needed to, you know, function his business. And so he met him where, where, where he was, but he also didn't keep him there. And so I think that's important. Let people know that I genuinely, genuinely care where you are right now. And what that's, what the, and that may look differently. You know, some people may be um, dealing with things at home or dealing with things from, from within, you know, yeah. personal struggles. And you have to just go in and just let people know that I care, you know, that yeah. I care. And so I think that's very important. When you talk about setting the tone, setting the mm -hmm. culture for, uh, uh, and being in a leadership position. Yeah, absolutely. And, and kind of being aware of those teachable moments as you go, because like you said, you can sort of fulfill that need right there in that moment, but then don't let that slip away because there could be a moment there to teach and to train someone how to become more part of that culture that you're trying to set and just let them know, look, this is how we do it. And, and it's an ongoing process too. So mm -hmm. that's, that's perfect. Now, so the next, so the next letter is the O in tone, right? For obstacles, because mm -hmm. we're always going to have that. So we always have to address kind of potential potential obstacles, potential roadblocks. Um, how do you, you know, as lit leader, a Christian leader in an environment where it may not always be received, or it may be in the minority, uh, that faith that you're representing? Um, what are the obstacles, kind of, that that leaders deal with? Um, you know, in, in mainstream workplace, I mean, I'm sure you've had jobs outside of ministry before. And do you ever have a time where you walked in and you kind of realized, okay, this environment may not be as as inviting or welcoming to my faith as I thought. So what right. did you do? And, and you may not have been a leader in that situation. I don't know. But talk about kind of every, – because everybody, in my opinion, is a leader. So the way we mm -hmm. portray our faith and the way we live it out is leadership in itself. Talk about maybe an example of, of some of the obstacles you, you face. Yeah, I think one of the biggest obstacles is just people not being aware, not people not knowing, right? And so uh, with our background in faith, and uh, they may not know everything that we know. They may not understand that their guidelines or their, their, their value system may be just different than ours. So mm -hmm. they just don't know, right? And so uh, anytime I'm in a space to where I know that that's not the dominant belief, you know, my faith, then I, what I try to do is I just try to lead by example. You know, I try to, I, I really, I firmly believe in that, you know, cause it's, it, it's not, you know, it won't do me any good going in trying to just tell people what to do, mm -hmm. you know, telling people you need to act better. You need to do this or you need to do that. And sometimes I find myself as just an employee, right? I'm not, not necessarily in a leadership position, but I still find myself every day that I need to be an advertisement for Christ, that wow. I need to demonstrate my faith. Like, this is something I need to live out every single day. So, you know, for me, I think it's just the big component is just about leading by example. Leading by example, man. Serving, yeah. Servanthood, right? Mm -hmm. Serving leadership, right? Uh, when people see that, they'll notice something different about you. They'll notice that you don't engage in certain conversations at work like like others do, right? Mm -hmm. that, that you take your time. You, you're, you're there for people. You're uh, you care about people, right? Mm -hmm. And I believe that 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 people will notice that they will they will see that and be drawn to that, right? It's not so much about you, but it's about the God that you represent. You know, uh, you know, Scripture says, if I, if I be lifted up, I'll draw men unto me. And I firmly believe that. I firmly believe that 
if we lift Christ up in the workplace, people will be drawn to us. So I think the biggest thing is just leading by example, understanding why you're there, right? And that it's not just a job, but mm -hmm. it's an assignment. You know, it's yeah. an assignment that you have to, mm -hmm. to, to, to magnify God in whatever space you may be in. That's great. No, that's awesome, man. And I'm going to, I'm going to elaborate a little bit too on that because on the topic of obstacles, like I'm going to maybe shock some folks and say, you know, one of the obstacles could be opportunity. And what I mean by that is opportunity to fail, opportunity to have somebody or have a situation poke holes in your faith, in your spirituality because of how you react. So mm -hmm. when things when things come at you at the workplace, those people are watching you. Mm -hmm. And we've talked about this in past episodes. You know, they're watching to see what happens when Mr. Christian is faced with some adversity, right? Yeah. Because that's an opportunity to fail is how I look at that. It's an opportunity to, if we don't react the right way. And, and, and that's why, why I say an opportunity to fail instead of, you know, some people might say, well, that's an opportunity to, to show Christ and the opportunity it is, but I think it's going to resonate with people when we talk about there could be a situation where if you don't react right, it could blow this whole thing up in your workplace as far as how you reflect your faith. So I think that's going to stick with people more to understand, oh, well, there's an opportunity and I don't, I'm not, I don't want to go that direction because that could be a whole, I could turn everything upside down. So opportunity for failure whenever adversity comes. So let's realize that, right? Let's realize some of the attacks that could be out there. Let's realize some of the, the magnifying glass we're under. And then how do we shift that when adversity comes? Because we're going to be different. That's our goal is to be different, to not be normal and not fit in when adversity comes. We right. want to be, we want to stand out in those moments. Cause like you said, you know, people are going to look, people are going to watch. And so those are opportunities. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think, do you ever, I guess the audience that's going into a, an environment that they feel like it's hard to represent their faith. It's hard to, like you said, be an advertisement. If there's an audience out there that's struggling with that, you know, how do they kind of create that? Um, I don't know. How do they be on uh, prepared to defend that? I guess when they go in, how do we defend against attacks? How do we defend against things that are going to, maybe create holes in uh, or appear to create holes in our spirituality in the workplace. How do we kind of defend that going into the situation? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, th things are going to attack us. <clears throat> things are going to come up, come, come up against us. And so uh, being prepared for opposition is crucial. And so I would just prepare the way Jesus did, you know, Mark chapter one, 35, he talks about how he was uh, in prayer you know, uh, morning and how he went off to a solitary place and that how this was his normal, right? Mm -hmm. This is something that he did on a regular basis. And I think sometimes uh, we don't put enough emphasis on prayer and mm -hmm. how just getting in the right mental space and the right uh, spiritual space, understanding that our cup needs to be filled, right? Uh, so that we can pour into others. Yeah. Uh, I think that was the key uh, with, with Christ is, that, okay, let me fill my cup up first. Let me pray. Let me get in the right mental and spiritual space first, right? Mm -hmm. Let me pray for those that I'm getting ready to interact with, that I'm getting ready to serve, right? Mm -hmm. And so now I'm in that space. I'm in, I'm in a space where I'm ready uh, to, to, to lead. I'm ready to serve because, because my cup is now full of grace mm -hmm. and mercy and patience and tenderness, yeah. right? I'm not yeah. waiting for someone to, to do something for me. But I'm waiting. I'm I, when I'm I'm in the position to where I'm I'm ready and willing to do something for someone else, right? right. And I think sometimes when we go into these workspaces, we're we're just on edge. We're on edge because we want someone to do something for us. You know, we're on empty. And when someone doesn't do something for us, when somebody you know looks at us the wrong way or asks us something in the wrong way, or so, and we're on edge and we're ready to snap, we're ready to you know uh, you know you know, say something right. back to this person or, and we, and so, but yeah. we understand that we're coming in knowing that yeah. I'm not here to, to be served, but I'm yeah. here to serve. And I think that puts us in a right position when we, when we really focus in on prayer 
and, and getting away in a solitary place and making that our focus. Um, so yeah, that, that's how I would prepare. That's how I prepared in the past, understanding that, you know, God, I have to be in the right mental and spiritual space going into this workplace, understanding that they may not serve me, but I know that I can come in and serve them. Right. Yeah. So right. just having that, having that mental shift uh, and it can, can, can put us at ease and can put the people around us at ease as well. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Cause it's got to start kind of internally, right. Before we can impact the external, we got to be, you know, we got to get our play, our, our, ourselves in that place of stability before we go into an environment that could be, cause like you said, Jesus knew every day, every morning he was going to face something. Right. right. He's going to face opposition, adversity. So he had to get right. And if he, you know, he was Jesus. So if he felt like he needed to get, he was already perfect. Right. But he felt like he had to get in a good place to face that day. And, and right. I think even more the case with us, you know, now, especially because, you know, there's opposition of all kinds of all different flavors out there. So, um, yeah, no, that's good because there are obstacles, but, so setting the tone obviously involves an N, which we call non-negotiables. Uh -huh. These are sort of the things that we talked about. I, you know, I, I, I think at the front end, we talked about framework and foundation of our faith and, and how we set, what are those things that just aren't negotiable? They're, they're not wavering, right? They're steady. They don't, they, they're consistent. Nothing, we don't, we don't waver off of these. So how does that in your mind apply in that workplace or in that environment? You know, if you're a coach and in, you know, maybe not as a job, but you're just a volunteer coach of your kids athletic team and you're around families or people that maybe you're different based on your faith, you know, it could be any sort of social setting, but you know, particularly for those that are listening that are leaders in the workplace, you know, what, what are those things that are non-negotiable? When you step into that environment, those people know what they're getting with Robert Harper. Those people know when you walk through the door, these are the foundational principles that he, they're, they're not wavering. And, 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 you know, this is who he is. Yeah. Uh, I'll just give you one, John. You know, one thing that I've learned is to be able to, um, walk slow and through every situation and circumstance that, that comes about, you know? And what I mean by that is that, uh, be patient, mm -hmm. be patient. Because a lot of times, especially when we're dealing with people, you know, um, we're dealing with, I've dealt with teenagers and, you know, they, they have things coming at you, you know, and if you're so quick to respond, if you're quick to, to say the first thing on your mind, uh, you may get it wrong, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Or that, that, that first reaction. And so sometimes it just takes patience and because people need it, we need it. And gathering all the information before you make a decision, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. Sometimes we can come to a conclusion and assume different things without having all the facts. And so I think that when, when people uh, get me, uh, I'm hoping they get a person of understanding and patience, right? That they get a person that, that yeah. is, that's truly trying to um, understand yeah. what's really going on. Like, I don't want to just, I don't want to just make a decision based on the content. I want to make a decision based on the context. And mm. so a lot of times people look at just the content and they make a decision you know, or they see whatever the behavior is, but there's always something behind the behavior, yeah. right? There's always, a, there's always a, the motivation behind the behavior. So if you get the context, you figure out what's really going on and you gotta be patient to do that. You gotta mm -hmm. have an understanding heart to be able to want to, to want to even do that, right? And mm -hmm. I think that, that, that just lets people know, once again, setting the culture that you care, that you understand, and you're, you're them. it's not just a job, right? And so uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, on one occasion, uh, guy was doing some work for me 
and 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 he he went MIA, you know, missing in action, and I could I didn't hear from him in a while, and and um, and I was when he finally called me back, I just asked him, you know, how was everything going? You know, I asked him about his wife, I asked him about his kids, I asked him about you know what was going on in his life, and he told me he really appreciated that, right? Yeah, because, yeah. You know, there was a deadline, and instead of me just you know coming in on the deadline, what needed to be done, I wanted to know what perhaps may have prevented you, you know, from meeting the deadline, right? Uh, and so the, con the content that he was giving me was that he was late, he, uh, the deadline had passed, and I haven't heard from him, right? And so all these things, especially as a leader, you know, can, can potentially cause you to get anxious, can, can cause you to get upset, you know, all the, you know, all these different emotions you can go through because the deadline is not being made. But if you if you focus on context over content, then you you dig deeper, right? You ask that person, okay, you know, uh, how's your wife doing? You know, how how are the kids doing? How are you doing, right? Like how how's life going, right? And so yeah. that person can appreciate that more, and now they're more invested because there's a relationship that's been built. So the next time, when when a situation com comes up like that, they're like, okay, hey, let me call, right? because this person genuinely cares. Let me call, even if, even if I'm a little behind on the deadline, or they'll be more eager to get the deadline done because it's not just about this business transaction, but it's about a relationship that you built with this individual. And so I think for me, patience, you know, God has really been putting that on my heart, is getting all the information. You know, don't be quick or in a rush or mm -hmm. hasty to, 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 to say the first thing on your mind or to judge it based on the content. You know, I remember even having a young man in my class, he was always putting his head down, always kind of lethargic, didn't want to do his schoolwork, didn't want to do anything. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of the teachers were, were call, calling him a bad student. He was, you know, not responsive, things of that nature. But come to find out, John, you know, the kid had a, you know, had a background to where he wasn't sure how, was, how he was even going to eat when he went home, right? And he didn't even eat last night, the night before. And so after you communicate with him, you talk with him, you're like, man, you know, hey, if I didn't, if I didn't know when I was going to eat, I probably wouldn't be in the best moves, best moves either, right? Yeah. And so, you know, you have to really dig a little bit deeper and try to figure out, like, what's the context? What's the context and not just the content? And that takes patience. That That's takes so a, a heart to really want to be understanding. That's so good, man. I Wow. And I've never heard it, it said like that, but, you know, I'm hearing you talk about patience and I'm thinking as a non-negotiable in that moment, every day you walk in that consistent thing that people know about you, it's going to also be grace. Like they know that they're going to get grace when they see you walk through the door, regardless of what you're going to bring to them or what they're going to bring to you, you're going to stay steady in that grace and that patience. So mm -hmm. they know that's a non-negotiable with you. They know that that's not going to change. That's a consistent mm -hmm. trait that they can count on. And I think that's important for our audience and for people who, who lead a team, you know, teammates like to know what consistencies you bring. they like to know that you have those stable, steady attributes that are going to help them that they can count on. Just like in that example, you know, that kid wanted to, he would have loved to know that he's got a steady, stable, environment and and meals and food are a consistent thing like he would love that like so they want to know that our team wants to know we're going to be stable and consistent grace is one thing with you that it sounds like is a is a non-negotiable and when i hear you talk about context and content it's, it's so good man and i think about the content is more of a symptom of the context really mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. it's more of a a byproduct so like you said you got to dig through and peel back that first layer which is the content because it would have been easy for you to react in that moment with that example of the person that missed the deadline like i know all of us as leaders our first reflex that reaction is hey facts right we're we're into facts we're into problem solving and the fact that you didn't do what you didn't do created a problem and i'm here to solve you know instead of doing that i guess I guess help the, under, the listeners understand that that wasn't easy, first of all, because your initial reaction might have been something else or what you wanted to say. So how did you, I mean, going into that situation, did you pray before you had the conversation? Did you 
already just know that you were going to treat that with grace going into it? How did you prepare for that? Yeah, I mean, we're human, right? And so those natural emotions, and especially being leaders, we want to get things done, right? We have these deadlines. And so that human nature comes up, John. We're like, okay, hey. Yeah. So then when I start finding myself in that space, I, I, I quickly go to God and pray, say, God, you know, what, are you, what would you have for me to say mm-hmm. in this situation, right? Because I believe in this person. I believe he's a good person. I believe she's a good, great person. What would you have for me to say in this situation? And I just believe that when you lead with patience, you just get a lot more accomplished. You know, when you lead with understanding, when you lead with trying to figure out the context, you just get a lot more done. You know, yeah. people, people are there for a reason. They want to help you. They want to be a blessing, right? But sometimes life happens. And when people can just know that you, you, you're understanding of that, uh, I think it just, it, it nurtures the relationship. And that's the kind of environment I, I want to set. That's the kind of environment I strive to, you know, to set uh, with anybody that works with me or around me is that, hey, I, I lead with patience, I lead with understanding, I lead with compassion. Uh, I'm trying to get the context and not just the content of, of, of the situation. And so I think if we do that a lot more within our relationships, not just in business, but even yeah. our relationships, you know, husband, wives, yeah. children, parents, right? If you, if you seek after the context, you know, not just the content, uh, and that takes patience and asking God for wisdom to do that. I think uh, relationships can be restored. Business can flourish. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, for people listening, that's my takeaway. That's my gold that I'm taking from this conversation along with other things. But that's the one thing I'm going to remember context versus content. And I hope, hope you guys wrote that down. I hope you understand. I hope you can put some context around what he's saying. So no, I think it's great because look, there's going to be all kind of external factors that can knock us around a little bit. And as long as we have those non-negotiables steady, those consistent things that you're talking about, we can go into any environment and operate and we can serve Mm -hmm. and we can bless Mm -hmm. if we have those non-shakable foundational principles that you're talking about. It's awesome, man. Um, So the E, right? The E in tone, T-O-N-E is evaluation. Mm-hmm. I mean, every, you know, as people, as leaders, we're always checking in to see where we're at progress wise. You know, we want to evaluate, <clears throat> are we doing this right? What does good look like? So how does Robert Harper step back kind of outside himself and look on a daily basis, on a weekly basis? <clears throat> how do you evaluate kind of, are you doing what you think good looks like? Are you representing that? What are some of the ways you measure that? Yeah, I, I do that by fighting against individualistic thinking. Uh, and what I mean by that is that I, I'm trying to, I'm going to every situation that I go in, I try to go into with a mindset of community and a collective, right? Uh, and so if I'm not making the community better, if I'm not making the collective better, the group better, then mm-hmm. I'm not doing my job, yeah. right? It, it's, it's all about it's all about community it's all about the collective it's not about the individualistic goals and aspirations it's not about the me but it's about the we mm-hmm. right and if i if i can shift my mind from me to we then i know what i'm looking for i'm thinking legacy right i'm not thinking yeah. just about robert's accomplishments robert's achievements how i can raise me up but i'm thinking about how we can all go up right and so my thing is is that how, how often am I, am I creating other leaders? How often am I sharing principles and ideas with people to where I'm fully invested in their lives and they're yeah. inspired to do the same work, right? Yeah. And so uh, that's kind of how I, I can evaluate something, right? Um, and I, a, a, a young man right now, he's in his early 20s. And I remember, you know, uh, working with him through his middle school and, and, and high school years. And uh, sometimes he had some challenges, right? But now... He wants to go into ministry himself. He's teaching Bible classes. He's serving, right? And it brings uh-huh. me a lot of joy just to oh, see yeah. that, right? Yeah. Because I remember when he was in middle school and in high school and how we worked with him and helped him through difficult moments in life and even in college, right? But yeah. now his heart is, uh, can I lead a Bible study? His heart is, how can I serve? How can I prepare, right? And so yeah. that's how I kind of evaluate, am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing, right? And you're not going to be perfect at it, right? Every person won't uh, 
follow your example, yeah. but that's the mentality that you go in with it. Yeah. The mentality is not just a me concept, but a we concept, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and I think that's how we get anything done. You know, any great accomplishment always happens with a we mindset over me. And so uh, that's, one of the, that's one of the ways in which I evaluate what am I doing, the impact that I'm making, am I really serving, uh, and am I just being driven by self, selfish ambitions? Right. And so that's how I kind of use that to check it. Yeah. No, I hear you. And, and, you know, you talk about, you you mean, it's on a, on the banner behind you live on purpose. And I talk all the time about live uh, on purpose for a purpose. Right. And Mm -hmm. so it's, it's gotta be intentional. Like what I'm hearing you say is this stuff doesn't just come to you. It doesn't just happen by accident. Like you gotta be looking for opportunities, right. For the we factor. You got to be looking for uh, that intentional. You got to be intentional about seeking out those people and those times where God may have just placed you uniquely in that moment. So that that unique moment was meant for you to be in. And Mm -hmm. so if we're thinking about that ahead of time and you're talking about community and and putting your individualistic goals aside for the greater, you know, the, the group or the team. And I think that's what every leader should hear. I think every leader that walks in an environment should be wanting to multiply themselves, right? I mean, mm-hmm. God's, in, God's into math. God's a, a great mathematician. He loves exponential multiplication. And he talked about discipleship, right? He talked about us pouring into others. It, it, those who water will themselves be watered, right? Mm-hmm. So if our individual goals are secondary, that's gonna, we're going to be fulfilled. We're going to get watered, right? But our first has to be watering others. And that's the whole purpose of, of this platform of not speaking for you, but I'm assuming that that's your platform is like to water others, pour into others. And, and then whatever our goals are, those will happen. Those will come to us. So it's an awesome perspective, man. It's an awesome way to look at it because I think there's people out there because, you know, I wrote a book that, talking about servant leadership and I think leaders, I talk about that leaders go into situations knowing that they're accountable. Mm-hmm. They're, the, they're the business owner of that mm-hmm. particular business unit or team or group. So they're accountable. Mm-hmm. You know, they've got to answer for outcome, right? Mm-hmm. But, but we get so laser focused as leaders that we've got to defend against what we think our responsibility is instead of how can I multiply this team? How can I pour into this team and watch it grow? How can this person, this person, this person become a leader? You know, how can we get them to that? Because I believe everybody's a leader. I believe everybody's got leadership traits. I say that almost every episode. God wired us to lead because we have influence. So that makes us a leader. So if we, if our perspective on influence is about pouring into somebody else, those qualities that we feel like we're gifted at, right? And they may have unique gifts. Everybody does, but pouring in our non-negotiables that we talked about, pouring in some of that tempo that we talked about, the foundation that we live about, that we reflect, if we can pour that into others, they take their gifts and then we multiply this thing and then everybody, it kind of expands, right? So based on that, because it sounds like you got an awesome mindset and, and we're not perfect. Obviously, Robert's got days where he doesn't feel like doing it right? So we can't let our feelings and our emotions, and that's a whole other discussion, but, you know, on how, what are people going to look at when they see, you know, and I always use the analogy of a footprint, you know, you look back on the trail you walked, and your footprint is evidence that you were there. What, what footprint in the regards of, in regards to leadership, would you say people are going to say about, you know, 10 years from now, Wherever you are, you know, they're going to look at the space you're in now and look back 10 years before and say, this was Robert Harper's footprint. This was his. And I use everybody uses the word legacy. Right. I mean, I think we're we're living every day is part of our legacy. We're just putting that puzzle together every day we walk. But what is your footprint of leadership? Yeah, I, I hope my footprint of leadership will be two things. Uh, number one, that I cared 
that I genuinely cared for other people, the people that were in my space, the people that I had that I was responsible for for leading. And then number two, that I was just passionate. I, I was passionate. I, re- I truly believed in what the work that I was doing, right? And I think we need more passionate people. Yeah. We need people that actually believe in the work that they're doing, whether that's ministry, whether that's on your job. People need to know that this is what you do and, yeah. and you believe in what you do, right? And so I, I'm hoping that when it's all said and done, that people will know, like, he cared, he, he served, you know, that's the kind of heart that he tried to lead with each and every day with individuals. And that while uh, he cared uh, and, he, and he was trying to be a great servant, he was mm-hmm. really, really passionate about what he believed in, right? He was really passionate about what he did. But sometimes what happens is that sometimes you get individuals that are really, really passionate. They're really, really focused. They're really, really locked in to what the assignment is. But sometimes they don't always have the grace and the mercy to go along with it. And so sometimes we have these great passionate leaders, but their, their, their patience level is not always there with those that, that, that are under them or work with them because they're just so super passionate. And so I'm, I'm hoping that I can have best of both worlds where I can be a passionate, uh, price passionate person, but also at the same time, people know that I care about people. Yeah, that's so good. That's so good. I think we need to hear more of that from leaders, from people in positions of authority, people from, you know, in positions of influence. I mean, I think we need to hear, we all need to be singing from the same hymnal when it comes to that, because I think caring is, is where it kind of starts like that, that that's, what's going to drive any of your passions, your gifts, your purpose. Like if you, if you're not, I guess if your heart's not in the right, because caring is kind of a reflection of your heart condition, in my opinion, and, and what you're motivated by. So um, you're, you're motivated by seeing other people benefit, seeing other people blessed and seeing other people walk this out and kind of unpack their gifts so they can go out and do what you're doing. Like, I think, I think that's where it starts. Right. And, and that's, yeah. what's going to drive you every day. And you talked about a passionate leader isn't always the greatest leader. Well, you know, I think passion really is the spark that we need, but it's not the fire that's going to sustain, right. It's not going to burn long term, Right. That's the good. passion is great. The passion, as you're saying that that's, what's coming to me. And I told you, I'm an analogy guy. I don't know why, but so it just kind of hit me that, yeah, we got to have that passion. That's what sparks the fire. But, to burn that fire long term, there's got to be other things that, like we talk about, the non-negotiables, the grace, the patience, the servanthood. <clears throat> you said servanthood like two or three times in this conversation. I love that word, and I hope people get that. So, um, I mean, I don't know what else to say, but other than this has been awesome. Like your perspective is awesome. Like I, I, I love it because. You know, you're a you're a rising. I, I'll say you're a rising star. Like when I say that, I mean your ministry is what I would say just starting to take off, right? I think your your influence and your platform, I think, is starting to just really starting to explode. A- am I accurate in saying that? Like I think you're starting to get in your sweet spot, your wheelhouse of where you're going, and and who knows what's coming from Robert Harper? Like I, this guy, guys, is audience i would tell you need to get his book robert how do we find like how do they find you they want to hear more nuggets about you and your platform and your 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 mission yes yeah, so i'm on all social media platforms linkedin as robert harper facebook is robert harper instagram robert harper two the, the, the number um and uh, my website is robert harper com. and okay. so yeah, if you want to reach me, you can also uh, purchase the book from the website as well, or you can just go directly to Amazon and, and just type in, talk to yourself, or type in my name, and it'll, it'll pop up. All right, all right. Well, I get, I mean, that makes it pretty easy, so nobody's got excuses on why they don't have Robert Harper's <laughs> materials, right? So um, any projects that are coming up that you kind of want to give us a sneak peek about or a little spoiler alert on what you're working on? Right. Uh, so the book is, 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 I'm getting ready to uh, combine an audio book with the, with the book in January. And so in January, I'll release an a audio book version uh, of the book. And, and also, uh, as you see, this band back here, we host an event called Live on Purpose uh, regularly throughout the year. This year has been a lot different mm-hmm. um, for several, you know, COVID and everything that's going yeah. on. Uh, but we're planning on doing another event 
in January of 2021. And so um, we're planning for that. Uh, you know, we don't know what the country's gonna gonna be looking like in January 2021, but that's the goal. That's the that's the plan. Awesome. Well, I, I expect an invite uh, to that. <laughs> and uh, no matter what the world looks like, I mean, we're talking about you know we got all this political stuff, election, COVID, you know, we don't know what the world looks like, but we do know what is going to stay and sustain yeah. and not change and what's not shakable, what's not negotiable. We all know it's, it's our faith. God already knows how this turns out. We know, you know, we know we win in the end, regardless of what's going on around us. Our job is to represent the ambassadors of the good news. And there's plenty of need for that. So, thank you again Robert I appreciate it listeners um, I hope I hope you got a lot from this like I did like I think these are maybe meant for more of my benefit than anybody because I learned something every time but listeners hey I hope you guys share this episode because you know somebody that needs it you know somebody that's right on the verge of being the leader they were called to be and that one of these things could could impact them so I hope you got something out of this like I did. I'm glad, Robert, again, thank you. And hey, until next time, be blessed.